Hey, good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of the Ride Along Radio Show, uh, the show where you have retired and former police officers to uh, speak on topics of the day and to give you our perspective, uh, our, the benefit of our police experience, and we shoot it to you straight with uh, no agendas or department talking points, and um, that's kind of uh, what, we, what we rely on to make our show unique and, uh, and different, and um, I hear that it's working pretty well for people. My name is George Holt, a uh, 25-year veteran of law enforcement, recently retired, to my left. Gil Contreras. Yeah, and my name's Kent. So what we do here is, um, again, we talk about the issues that are facing both the police and the community, things that are of mutual concern to both. And uh, we talk about them in a way that uh, will uh, give you, the again, the benefit of our experience. And I think you'll find that between the three of us, you'll find some wide and varied opinions and sometimes we get into heated discussions but uh well and you're not going to hear it in a way that you'll hear it anywhere else because cops that are working cops are not allowed to talk about things in the way that we do you're exactly it would never never happen so um every week we start off with our news of the day segment and uh kent's going to cover that for us today so i want to talk about if i can uh an, an article that was written uh by ian simpson uh, from reuters and it's dated october 6 2015 but it is it's current because uh, in the title which is america is releasing 6,000 federal inmates and in an unprecedented action is actually taking place this first week of november uh nonviolent drug offenders are being released from federal prison um early um as, as a more um, humane uh, act to uh, bring people out of the prisons and back into the communities. So my question is, why is this uh, article uh, titled America, quote unquote, is releasing 6,000 inmates? And after reading the story, I'm convinced that America is not doing any such thing, but actually Barack Obama has motivations for releasing the prisoners, not Americans. The release of these prisoners is to, quote, reduce overcrowding, unquote, and provide relief to drug offenders who received harsh sentences over the last three decades. The change in the sentencing happened with the U.S. Sentencing Commission, which is an independent agency that sets guidelines for federal crimes. Um, in this particular case, it's dealing with drug offenses. Okay, that, that change happened mysteriously just before the, the uh, grant of clemency to the so-called nonviolent drug offenders uh, by Barack Obama under the new sentencing guidelines. The sentencing panel estimated that its uh, change in guidelines could, re could result in 46,000 of the roughly 100,000 drug offenders in federal prison to qualify for early release. The 6,000-person figure is the first batch in that process. Uh, a very interesting quote in the article was, quote, the drumbeat of sentencing reform has come as U.S. crime rates have drastically declined over the past two decades. U.S. senators last week proposed a plan to reform the criminal justice system aiming to scrap sentencing laws that lead to the overcrowding. And I say, what drumbeat is that? The drumbeat the writer is referring to um, is, in my opinion, I'm going to put this out there because I'm sure we're going to talk about it, is a scheme to bring potential voters back into the uh, fold in the United States. It's a three-part process. One is to release as many prisoners as possible um, between now and the end of 2016. The second part is to get Congress to act on new legislation in a bill that will grant former convicts the right to vote. That's being kicked around right now as we speak as well. The third thing is uh, to bring these uh, prisoners out, uh, pardon them, or to have this new legislation passed in, in, a, in an effort to uh, bring them into the Democratic fold, just like is happening with the illegal aliens right now. Uh, now, when this happens, uh, these same former convicts will be allowed to apply for federal jobs. There is what's called uh, ban the box. Ban the box, and <laughs> and right now, banning obviously means to get rid of I something. I should have jumped in on that one, Gil. But ban right now, box. it seems that it's a two-part uh, process to make it easier great. to make it easier for convicts to apply for federal jobs, and during the hiring process, to put off that uh, that checking the box that they have a criminal record, so that. Um, they can't be uh, uh, discriminated against in some way of getting, uh, you'd be able to get that job. So it's kind of like uh, the old affirmative action hiring policies in the law to promote the hiring of women in greater numbers, um, but was not being achieved. 
So what the departments did was to move the requirement to say to jump over a six foot wall, which is typical in the uh, police departments. In the police departments during the physical fitness part of the uh, testing, uh, which uh, was the one event that women had the greatest difficulty passing during the physical fitness test. And to the end of the academy, they'll move it to the end instead of the beginning. But they didn't get the hiring process or numbers that they wanted for women. So they essentially just said, why do we need a six foot wall anyway? Let's just get rid of the wall. So what this means next is the federal government will no longer allow federal hiring to include any questions about someone's criminal past during the entire hiring, the entire hiring process. Excuse me. This will obviously trickle down to private employment hiring as well. So what does that mean for the good Americans that live in the crime infested neighborhoods where these former felons came from and are now going to be released back into these good people that I'm describing are the people that will be subjected who are subjected once again to the staggering violent crime that many of these now good reformed citizens committed before and will no doubt commit again. And the reason I say that is the recidivism rates imply that there is at least a 75% chance that these now reformed citizens will commit more violent crimes upon their return. Who will these now good citizens commit crimes against? The, ans- the answer is typically other blacks. Blacks commit at least 95% of the violent crimes committed against other blacks. It means that although Obama lives in an alternate universe, these past and future victims do not. These victims will once again be left to fend for their own lives in a cesspool of crime caused by Obama's newly formed, and I'm going to call them, you know, brown-shirted, good Samaritan voters. Brown shirt. Yes. Wow. Right. Earlier, I mentioned this article stated U.S. crime rates have drastically de- declined over the past two, two decades. Is it not apparent that the one major reason that crime rates have decreased is because we have been putting these so-called nonviolent drug offenders in prison and keeping their, them there for a long time? Who are these nonviolent drug offenders? Many of them have been involved in violent crimes, whether they were convicted of them or not. Many who were apprehended pled down to a lower or lesser offense so they would not be convicted of the higher crime and the incarceration time that comes with it. Drug dealing, excuse me, drug dealing is impossible to carry out without the accompanying death and violent crime that comes with it. These are largely not nonviolent drug offenders that will be let out of prison. That's a that's, that's an your argue. that's your party at work. That's a, that's an argument. Know. That's an argument for legalization of drugs if I ever heard one. Actually, and I think we should get into that at some point, too, and talk about the, the legalization of drugs. Because you're right, it's, it's, a violent, it's a violent industry. There's no such thing as a nonviolent drug offender, That's especially right. those who are sitting in federal prison, because you don't go to federal prison for mere possession. It's not a federal crime. You, federal crimes are, are trafficking and uh, manufacturing, things like that on a grand scale. Grand conspiracies is what lands you, lands you in federal penitentiary. So... We're talking about arch criminals, pretty much. We're not talking about somebody who got caught with a joint or a rock in their pocket. That's just, does that's it, just does not the it, case. It doesn't also mean that there won't be some success stories out of this. But I'm going to tell you something. When they let these people back into those neighborhoods, there are going to be people who have to live there that are going to get killed. They're going to be innocent bystanders. They're going to be children. they are going to be... You know, women. It's, who a, it's already happened in Chicago. A nine-year-old right. little boy you just got killed. Uh, how many? How many? Uh, you said six thousand. That's, That's the, the first, first number. batch. Yeah. The first batch. Forty-six thousand. Okay. Well, 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 let me ask you this: uh, Was there any talk that this was being done to relieve overcrowding? No. The 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 push for this from the, from the left is this whole notion of quote mass incarceration close quote. And uh, if you recall, you know, all of these mandatory sentencing laws came under the Clinton administration because during the 80s and 90s, when we were out there on the street uh, fighting the war on drugs, uh, it was crazy. South Los Angeles was the wild, wild west, for God's sake. It was. And so and so this is how we address it with 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 mandatory sentencing, with uh, uh, three strikes law. You know, and that's why crime has been in a steady decline for the for the past several years is because of uh, uh, the sentencing because of uh, three strikes, because these guys are still continue to kill each other. Um, it, it, that's why crime ha- has, has gone down. But the, uh, you know, the impact of the, the danger of these progressive ideas uh, is like Prop 47 in California, which made a bunch of drug crimes misdemeanors. You know, I heard an academic on NPR the other day, and he was, it was touting the, you know, the, the new recidivism rate. 
well, these people aren't going back to state prison in, in, you know, in the numbers that they used to, and that's as a result of Prop 47. Because they're not felonies anymore. Not that that's they're not doing exactly, them. That's what yeah, he didn't say, doing them. Yeah. is that they can't go back, for God's sake. Because they're misdemeanors. They're still committing the same crimes, but, but now they can't go to prison. Now, in, I remember specifically what, where we would put somebody in jail and they'd be out and look at his split. Okay, but with today's environment, with what's going on out here, we're talking about the Ferguson effect and how that's going to affect police officers. I know that letting these people out in mass, okay, whatever the political reasons are, but, but the reality is letting them out in mass back into these neighborhoods is going to mean a, a greater potential violence to be perpetrated on law enforcement officers. And it's going to have a, de- a deleterious effect, a culminating effect, on the response of officers overall. This, this will trick, trickle down to how I want to go do my job, do I want to do my job? And we all know that it's hard to control what, you know, if, if we're out in a car and we're going to a call, I can go to the call and I can say, because we, we you know, even the best of times, we had officers that did this. Uh, GOA, gone on arrival. UTL, unable to, to locate. locate. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I, I will only look where I want to look. Okay, if I don't want to make an, effect, uh, an arrest, affect an arrest, if I don't want to go find it, if I don't want to get myself into, into quote-unquote trouble and end up at the end of a chopping block where the federal government is now investigating me, um, I, you know, I won't do that. I'll, I'll find something else to do. And, and well, now, you, you can't get in the car and manage police officers. Right. There's, there's two, two officers in the car. There's no sergeants in the car with them typically. But now let me ask you a question. So in terms of this... And in terms of it being married up with Ban the Box, and I don't believe in coincidences, so I do not believe for a second that these things aren't tied together. You see this all the time. If you look at it's these things. It's an agenda. With, it's a progressive Well, that's what I'm saying. If you, if you look at these right. things with an understanding, if you look at them as we like to say the third eye, that you you see what's in front of you, but you <laughs> that also. Like Joe Madison now. You don't listen to Joe Madison, do you? No, I don't even know who that, that is. Uh, Joe Madison okay. on, on Urban View. He's, he's no. a damn nut. So, <laughs> so if you look at those with this thing from that perspective, you see that these things are seemingly unrelated, but they clearly are. And we, we've seen this before. And I don't believe for a second that this, um, the release, early release, is not tied with the ban the box thing. However, I think that it, you would probably ask the people in charge, they would tell you that, yeah, these things are tied together because we're trying to lower recidivism. We're trying to um, make it so these guys have options other than going back to prison. And, and, and as far as it being a democratic agenda, I, I disagree for this reason. Let me lay, let me sit back. Let me. No, I disagree for this reason. <laughs> the, the Democrats don't need any help. The Democrats have won five out of the last six popular votes in presidential elections. The Republicans are the ones that need the help. Okay, let, let me give you some statistics here. Sixty-seven House seats have been lost since Barack Obama took office. Fourteen to sixteen Senate seats have been lost. Nine hundred and ten legislative seats have been lost in the states. I don't know how many gubernatorial seats have been lost. We just had an election in Kentucky where there was a, the Tea Party conservative governor was elected. No, they can't help themselves. You think, you think they're okay. I suppose, and this is my opinion, that if you were a criminal organization from top to bottom, which is how I perceive, well, I don't, and that's how I perceive the Democrat Party, I don't perceive the, the Republican Party much better than that. Okay? Exactly. That's Not exactly much right. better. Right. Okay, they, at least they're trying to reform themselves, and, and it's, well, it's, they it's, have great, to. Sure. it's great comedy. It, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful Political debates theater. to watch yeah, this. But Political it, theater. It, at, least, at least on the surface, it looks like somebody's fighting back against the establishment. I have to say that the Republican Party is so far gone. That, that I think that this is now mainstream behavior of the Democrat Party. Totally okay. mainstream. So let's do this. Um, we, I'm sure the people out there watching who are probably uh, chomping at the bit and screaming at their, uh, their iPhone <laughs> screens. Uh, let me give you a call-in number, 323-293-3375. You can send us a tweet at um, Ride Along Radio. So um, back, back to uh, your point, I just want to give people a chance to to call in and yell at us in person instead of just or yell, yell yelling at you, at the screen. Yeah, yell, at yell at you. Calling yeah. in yell at Kent. Make sure you get the color of my shirt right this time. Right, exactly. Um, you know, it's very interesting, and, and even people who don't agree with this on the surface should look at it and, and, and weigh what you're saying because, again, th- to me, there's no way that this is not all connected. Mm-hmm. In, in terms of um, long recidivism, and you've said yourself, there will probably be some success stories out of this. A few. Uh, there will be it some. It will be an sure. exception, be exception, but not, not the, the rule. rule. Rather right. than the rule. Uh, but the idea is, and this always happens, and I refer, I've referred to the societal pendulum before, 
When something is perceived to be too far to one end, we overreact and we send it all the way to the other end, and then it kind of rests back in the middle. That's for all of the people who are out here viewing, assuming that everything we're seeing is what we're supposed to be seeing. I, I, you know, you, you can be fooled into watching the Kabuki Theater in front of you, but there's always a motivation behind it has, that has nothing to do with the pendulum other than the fact that somebody or, it or somebody's something. Agenda. Absolutely. Sure. They were waiting for Absolutely. that pendulum to come back. Never let a crisis go to waste. Right. We, we see this with every every level of government that we get. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have sold. That was us. Obama so, administration. That. So let's uh, it's time for our first break. And again, uh, call in three, two, three, two, nine, three, 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 seven, five or send us a tweet at Ride Along Radio. And uh, watch the tech dubs. OK, so welcome back to the Ride Along Radio show. Um, I'm George. Gil. Kent. And uh, we're going to be talking about the Ferguson effect today. That's actually our topic today. And the Ferguson effect is the theory that says that uh, police officers nationwide are becoming less proactive in policing because they don't want to end up um, scrutinized. They don't want to end up uh, with any issues. They don't want to be uh, or disciplined or not given the benefit of the doubt as if they are involved in a high, highly publicized event like Ferguson, like Baltimore, like Cleveland. Like uh, we saw last week in the, the classroom in South Carolina, like some of you have seen uh, with the video and the, that was posted on, online right now uh, about the officer who challenged the kid to fight. So officers are kind of, uh, actually the kid challenged the officer to fight and the officer took him up on it. So officers are um, concerned about the well-being of their, uh, their ability to make a living, their personal freedom, their re reputation, et cetera. So uh, the question is, are we seeing a slowing down of uh, of policing in our well, country I, I, as a result? I, I think, you know, at the International Chiefs of Police Association conference last week, uh, President made some comments about that, uh, and so did uh, Director Comey of the FBI. And, and, and it seems to me that some of these guys think that that's what's happening. Right. But there's no direct evidence that it's happening. Right. And, and I think the Ferguson effect is, is really something else. It isn't police officers not doing their job. The Ferguson effect, to me, is how it's affected the general public. As they now think, oh, I know, I just challenge law enforcement and and know that everybody's standing around me with with a with a camera so now i have a right to challenge him i know that a cop can't touch me he can't he can't do anything to me if there's a bunch of cameras around and so i think that's the ferguson effect and i think that's what's uh, making police work harder today is more people are are more willing to challenge them because they see these videos they go oh well if we at least get the we can antagonize the cop and if we get him to do something anything that is even slightly inappropriate. Well, now we have evidence that police are, are, are brutal. You know, I, I agree. I agree with that. But I think it would be really impossible to think that with everything going on, uh, that, that police officers aren't actually making sometimes an unconscious decision about what they're going to do or not do or a conscious decision to say, I'm not getting involved. I, I, would, I would find it very hard to believe that even the director of the DEA came out probably in the last 24 hours, and is now agreeing with uh, Kumi, the FBI director. Um, r really, I mean, I, if, if, I'm, if I'm going to, uh, if I'm going to end up getting in a fight with somebody and I'm a white officer and I've got a, 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 a black subject, whether it's a student or somebody in the field, um, I am going to probably do everything I, I can do probably not to get into that situation, even, uh, if, even uh, if it's legitimate well, and, and, and I need here, to do here, something here, about the, the it. Working, and I agree with working, you. But the working officers that I know who are still out there working say they don't give a shit about that. They don't care about the, quote, Ferguson effect, close quote. They're out there to do their yeah, job. They, and he said it's an unconscious have, decision, though. If uh, you have a righteous bad guy, they, they, they take care of biz. Well, I, well, well my I, question I, is this, yeah. though. I wonder how the, how the director of the FBI or DEA would know not being involved in street-level law enforcement. All, all the FBI does with that is they collect data every year for the Uniform Crime Report. When that data comes in quarterly, they can collate it, and then annually they publish a report. So he wouldn't even know what's going on real time in the streets. Oh, the first time I, I ever heard about it was Chief McCarthy uh, in uh, Chicago. He, that's the first place I heard it. Well, but, it would be easy to, to, to say in briefings with a sergeant or personal co private conversations after briefing or somewhere in the station that, you know, things are getting really out of control. Last night I went to a call, and I, in, I did not 
you know, get out of my car. I did not go look for this person. These are going to be th- very difficult things to tabulate about the activity or inactivity, the choices that are being made by law enforcement officers. In, well, you know, in, you'll in see it in terms account. of quantifiable things like arrest and well, sites and all that I, kind I of thing. I understand in a lot of these key cities, the violent crime rate has gone up 25%. Well, and I'm glad you said that because we have a call-in. Uh, our, our guest today is a call-in guest. is uh, Detective Steve Loomis, who is the president of the Cleveland Police Patrolmen's Association. And uh, Steve's got some interesting, uh, interesting take on that. Steve, are you on the line? Yes, sir. How are you, sir? Very good, thank you. Okay, so we saw some of your uh, uh, comments that you'd made in the media regarding this uh, Ferguson effect or whatever, whatever people want to call it. I understand there's different names for it. What's your take on that? Um, it's absolutely happening. Um, you know, police officers are willing to take the inherent risks of the job, you know, much to the dismay of our mothers. Not a mother out there that wants her kid to be a cop. And um, we're willing to take those physical risks on, but what we're not willing to do and what we're seeing across the country, I think, is that we're not willing to to um, risk our careers over a media event, risk our careers over, risk prosecution from overzealous political media frenzied prosecutors like we have here in the city of Cleveland. Um, you know, we're just not willing to get out and do that. And I think that that is the police officers here in Cleveland, especially my membership, and we have 1,500 cops here, um, are in self-preservation mode. You know, they're answering radio assignments that they get. They're doing a very good job at that. I, I encourage them and demand that they be very diligent in, in answering those radio assignments and doing good reports. Um, they, If somebody's flagging them down, you know, they better stop and <laughs> That's right. deal with that situation. If there's a little old lady on the side of the road, they better stop and change that tire. And I want the body cam video from that so I can get that out to the media and to the folks that think that, you know, police officers are nothing but cold-blooded murderers. You know, that's the, that's the false narrative that's going on out there in the country today, and, um, and especially here in, in Cleveland. You know, we're very, very small groups of people, by the way, you know. The, the very odd part about this here in Cleveland is that I've been a policeman for 22 years, and we're experiencing more support from the citizens of this city than ever before in my career, aside from maybe a few short weeks after 9-11. Um, oh, sure, yeah, guys, we saw a big bump then. Yeah, sure. and, but my guys are reporting to me that, you know, f- folks are coming up to them randomly, folks are coming up to me. I can't go to Sam's Club and, uh, you know, not have a half a dozen people come up and, and shake my hand and say, hey, we're with the guys. You know, and that's not something that happened um, five years ago. That's the flip side of all this. Hi, Steve, this is Kent. How are you? Hi, good. Very good, sir. Good. Um, and you made a comment about um, being involved. What they don't want to be involved in is, is some crazy media-driven event. But to, to get to the point that it's a media event, something has to happen. And so you don't, you don't know who's got the camera when you're out in the field, and you don't know when the event is going to happen. So it, you can't necessarily just say I, I don't want to end up in, event, in, in an event when you might not be able to help that. Right. That was going to be my question, Steve. This is yeah. Gil Contreras speaking. Uh, what exactly are cops not doing? What, what are they not doing? They still have to respond to radio calls. Sure, they, they're responding they're, to radio calls. And, and you know, we're, we're reactive. There's no proactive policing going on. In the okay, oh, stop right there. What's proactive policing then from your perspective? Well, proactive policing is going in the, in the high crime areas, known high crime areas, known drug activity areas, um, um, and proactively policing, becoming a presence, challenging um, groups of people that are on the, on the, uh, standing on the corner, you know, after we're watching them serve up a bunch of cars. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Steve. Proactive policing. We, Steve, we don't Steve. have the, the ability or the gumption to, to do the traffic stops. Um, anymore because of the false narrative that's going on out there. And as you guys know, uh, you know, probably I would estimate 70 to 75 percent worth of good police work comes from traffic stops. Absolutely. Um, that's a tool. It's an enforcement tool. That have been arrested. Sure. That's all about obs work, man. It's some of the best arrests I ever made were based on observations that I made, but not absolutely. responding to a radio call. So then are Absolutely. You, are you, but yeah, see, Steve, are, are you saying that, that so the... 
the officers in your department are not doing that anymore. They're not. Uh, if they see transactions, they're, they're more reluctant to engage the seller or the street well, dealer or something. No, I'm not. I'm not saying if they see transactions, if they put themselves, what they're not doing is they're not going down into these neighborhoods. Um, and and you know, fellas, the the very very saddest part of this whole thing is that the people that need us the most. Yes. There's not a neighborhood in this That's city right. where the ma- vast majority of these folks aren't good, God-fearing, law-abiding yep. citizens exactly that right. want the police around and that respect the police. Yeah. They live in different levels of fear. You know, I had a I, I had an elderly woman that, that would call me on the phone. I, I had given her my business card um, back when I was in the patrol car, and I couldn't go talk to her directly from her front porch. I had to park on the next street over, and my right. partner and I would walk through the backyard. And if you don't, Be- if you don't see it, you can't do anything about it. You have to exactly. go hunt for it. Exactly. And, you know, we're down in the city of Cleveland. Um, we're down about 25,000 um, traffic tickets, um, and we, we're. And it's not that we're not making the same amount of um, traffic stops. I think that's probably down. But we're, you know, we have the D- Department of Justice in here, and they want a community orientated policing project. And and, and that's up close and personal. That off than that, by advising and sending people. And and, and community based policing is that the, at the nuts and bolts of of. Uh, of Getting in the mix and seeing the crimes happen and knowing who these people are yeah. and having better intelligence and directing your people, you'll never. It's like driving around in a patrol car; you'll never see what's underneath the, the the rug or the blanket until you lift it up. To lift it up, you have to get into the neighborhoods. So if yep. you're not and if you're not if doing not that, support us when we go into those neighborhoods. Um, they being the administration, they being the media, they being, you know, whoever. Then we're not going to go in those neighborhoods. And, and you know, it's really, it, just that simple. And, and there goes the, I, there goes the crime rate. Hundred percent you're not doing you. proactive. And then, and yeah, to, that's a to piggyback shame. on something Kent just said, it was once told to me when I was a young policeman that a long time ago, a long time ago when I was a young policeman, that um, the police officer in the police car knows about as much as what's going on in that community as a fisherman does about what's going on at the bottom of the sea. The fisherman paddles around, and every once in a while, he pulls some stuff up from the bottom or halfway to the bottom. So he knows there's fish down there, but he doesn't really know what's going on down there. And, and the, the reason I was told that was encouraged me to get out of the car, to engage people, to learn about what's really going on in the community. Because in the police car, you're only going to see so much. And here's the flip side of community-based policing. Is community-based policing, when you know who these people are, and you know them by face and by name and where they live and where their extended their family families. lives, they have no sure. place to hide. When they, it, it, it actually cuts down on crime when you're when you're in there and you're face to face with this yeah and, and hey, if you're listen, you don't have to sell me on community based policing yeah. um, we're huge fans of that um the problem that specifically that we have here in cleveland is that between the year 2003 when we had 100 community policing officers out there we had cops on bicycles we had cops on foot patrols we had cops in the schools we had cops in the parks and, and rec centers and the pools um, we had community policing cops everywhere. We had 15 horses that were at the schools. We had a helicopter that would land in the backyard of the schools on career days. We had all that, and, and it was huge. It was crucial. We had many stations in every councilman ward in, in, in the city of Cleveland, and, and those folks had a lot of connections in the community. So right. community policing is not something that anybody needs to sell me on. They need to sell the mayor of the city on it. They need to sell more importantly, the finance director of this city on it, because between 2003 and 2006 in the city of Cleveland, they downsized our department by over 500 police officers. But now they it just, becomes discouraging, does it not? That, that Well, the, absolutely, and, and we're operating with the skeleton crew, so we don't have the luxury of being able to stop and get out of the car, because the guys that are in the zone cars right now are literally going run to run to run to run for a 10-hour shift. Call to call. And then if you're not doing proactive police work... Then you're back in the car, where you have these uh, reactionary incidents that happen. Yeah, absolutely. Where a lot of these incidents come from. Yep. And and so, is it possible that your people are in the car and they're saying, um, you know, I, consciously or unconsciously, I'm not going to get involved? This, you know, there's a lot of way to kiss off calls. Yeah. Lots of ways no, to kiss no, off no, calls. They're not kissing off calls. Well, they're kissing. They're, they can get there. They answer the call because that that has to be reflected on the report. They have to get there and dispo this call. 
can they yeah. not get there and dispo this call without getting involved in, in many of the things that they would have originally before all no, this craziness that, happened? Yeah. No, I don't think that that's I, – I don't think that they're um, shortcutting the calls that they get. They're, they're going and they're doing their due diligence, and, and we encourage them. You do a good investigation. You go talk to three neighbors and find out what happened. You make the arrest if you need to make the arrest. Um, I think what we're seeing here in Cleveland – is the proactive stuff in between the calls. Right. The proactive stuff is not happening. Um, we used to have strike force units. You know, in the city of Cleveland, we don't have a gang unit. Wow. Um, we don't have an auto theft unit. We have 22 what? miles of beach on Lake Erie bordering a foreign country. We don't have a harbor unit it, or it, ports and harbor It's your unit. economy at work. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 wow. Yeah, it's a it's, it's terrible situation for these guys to be in. And, you know, I, I've been very active in the community. Um, I go to these community meetings since December. I was the, the elected president two terms. Then I took three years off, and then I got reelected um, in December. And I've been going to community meetings, and you know, two, three, four a week, because it's important. Communication is key. Mm-hmm. So important. To, to success. If you're, doing, if, if, if you're doing your job. Yes. And you're doing it right, like you say you're doing it, your people are doing it. How do you avoid the media-driven hysteria and the events that we're talking about? Well, I don't think you can avoid it because we just had an incident happen in Cleveland last year that we just covered a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Actually, I mean, it's under, there are certain things that are going to happen. Um, and I'm, I'm referring to the Timir Rice um, incident mm-hmm. um, here. And um, actually, actually, Steve, so what, what was it like in your department uh, during that period of time, you guys having that focus of the whole nation on you. We get it in L.A. here all the time. But yeah. um, for you guys there, what, what was that like? Well, it's, it's you know, the media, I think, makes more of it than, than, than anybody else does. You know, mm-hmm. we've had some protests, and, you know, we have 30 to 40 to 50 people show up at these at these protests, you know, the no justice, no peacers, and, and you know, and we're – there's not a cop out there in, in Cleveland that won't take a bullet to protect your right of free speech. There it is. You know, you have to be safe about it. You can't, we don't allow, we have no tolerance policy the chief has here. Um, we're not going to allow them to, to block traffic on a highway, for example. Um, but you can have public square all day long. Are you, you, know? are, are you, are you committed to the fact that, that, that you may become a casualty in, in, in any of your people at any time being wrapped up in one of these events? And they may lose their jobs over this, or have the, fed, the federal government come in and, and do a, a civil rights investigation. Well, they're already under consent decree now. The federal now. government, it, it, the federal government is a joke when it comes to this stuff. The Department of Justice <laughs> came in here. I love it. <laughs> they, they pulled 600 reports, random reports out of the last 10 years, and they came to some pretty nasty conclusions that aren't supported. In fact. You know, in 2014, we had over 400,000 calls for service. We had less than 300 complaints to the Civilian Review Board. Uh, we had 36,000 people arrested. Uh, 36,000 people arrested. We had less than 400 uses of force. And, and I mean, do the math on that. That right. means 35,600 people went to jail professionally, peacefully, no fuss, no muss, no injuries, and no anything, Right. So why, what are we talking about, a pattern in practice? You know, Steve Dettelbach, um, the uh, uh, federal prosecutor that's, you know, spearheading this big um, drive to, you know, by the way, their, their report is completely boilerplate. All you have to do is take the city of Seattle name off and put the city of Cleveland on it, <laughs> and it's the same thing. Well, well, well why, why is that? It, it, have you heard of the 21st century policing program that the federal government's uh, unleashed on local law enforcement? Um, I, I, I'm not well versed in it. Are, 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 have you heard or have you read that the federal government is, is actually trying to undermine local law enforcement in an attempt to, to have more federal control over local policing? Yes. Okay. Well, that's what 21st century policing is about. Yeah. And under consent decree orders, they'll come in with, with the mm-hmm. Civil Rights Office of the uh, U.S. Justice Department. And they will force you into court because it costs money and it's hard to defend against the federal government because they're always right. They'll yeah. force you into a consent decree order and, and start managing your police department for you. And, and, and all of this is in an attempt to have 
much more federal control over local yeah. law enforcement, just like education and everything else. Well, I told, I, I questioned Steve Delbach very publicly. I said, you know, one of, one of the examples that they used of excessive force was a, uh, a gentleman that was high on PCP. He was naked. He was punching his windows out. So he was violent. And he was bloody. Not because and he was our naked. Guys showed up there, and they didn't do much talking with that guy because obviously they don't want to get near him. Right. And they tasered him. Mm -hmm. And they, the Fed, said that that was an excessive use of force. And I'm like, what? What are um, our options? Please teach me, oh wise one. Tell me yeah. what we should. Well, have again, done. and this is why when you have people who haven't done street level policing, exactly. uh, coming from the federal level, they just do not get it. They don't have the the background or the experience. To speak about that with any credibility to well, me. If you have a and program, even, you don't need to get it. And it wasn't even FBI agents that that did the investigation. It's a bunch of attorneys, mm -hmm. thirty-five-year-old yeah. Ivy League school, you know, federal prosecutors doing this big investigation. So I asked Steve Dettelbach, "What would you, what should we have done?" You know, he said, "Use your words." I'm like, "Geez, oh, geez. thanks for that bit of advice." Nice. Like, yeah. The guy's like, on PCP and he's punching out. He's naked and punching out windows. I mean, yeah. bloody. And, Use and your words. Bloody. So the taser was the perfect application Absolutely. for that. That's what it's and, for. And I told him, I said, the only other option that we would have had is four, four policemen going hands-on with this guy, exposing themselves to bodily fluid, exposing right. themselves to injury, exposing right. the patient, because you got to call him a patient because, you know, he's high on PCP and out of his mind, and, um, exposing the patient to injury. That's the only other option. And the best part about that is that the four of his buddies are going to be over on the sidewalk videotaping us and then we're yep. going to be on eyewitness news the next day that's you right. know perceivably beating the hell out of this guy because it's because know? it's four officers on one guy as opposed to one and, officer and, with a taser and we all know as police officers that that those the folks that are high in pcp don't feel any pain most of them are depressed they don't care about the outcome of it they you can't use pressure points you can't use you know any of that stuff you have to physically manhandle those arms back for, behind For them. the people that are listening, and, and I'm, I'm going back because PCP, liquid PCP, was became quite popular back in the 1980s, dip cigarettes, et cetera. But that was originally a tranquilizer. An animal if, tranquilizer. For an animal, I believe it was an elephant tranquilizer. Yeah, it's something that, yeah, that's why pain compliance doesn't work on PCP suspects. Right. That's why yeah. pepper spray doesn't work on PCP suspects. You have to, the taser to me, and this is as a certified taser instructor speaking here, the taser was developed for that kind of thing. It's, right. a, it's an electromuscular disruption device. And, and it, it doesn't works. matter. It's not about you know, pain. Just, it's about your yeah, muscles won't work. <laughs> we had none of that. <laughs> we just got, you guys have had those tasers out in California for a long time. We didn't, not at our department. I mean, we worked on we, well, projects. We, we did, we did uh, later on, toward the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, we, we finally got just tasers. Just before it closed. Yeah, we just got them <laughs> about five tasers. years ago, fellas. Wow. Wow, are you kidding <laughs> me? You know, it, it, it is complete insanity. Uh, the, the, everything that happens in, in, out on the West Coast, we get about 10 or 15 years later. Wow. Know, so, Steve, have um, you guys heard of canines? You guys need a canine out there? I'll bring my dog. Yeah, we need canines out. I told the chief the other day because he wants to put more one-man cars out there. And I said, that's fine, put more one-man cars out there, but I'm going to insist that they sit there and they wait until another car comes up before they go into the neighborhood that they get the call for. Where do you exactly see this going right. now? Where, where, where do you see all this going? Well, What's hold on, hold on, before we, because that's going to be okay. a meaty Sorry. subject. we got to go to a break. Steve, can you hang on? And I'd like to talk to you after the sure. break and, and bring, you, bring you back on. Can you, can you hang on with us through the yeah, break? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hey, folks, we're going to go to a break. Uh, again, you can tweet any questions you have at Ride Along Radio. And uh, our call number is 323-293-3375. We'll be right back. The track in the lake. The All right, and we're back here at Ride Along Radio Show. Um, we were discussing the Ferguson effect. And we have a call-in guest, uh, Steve Loomis, the president of the Cleveland Police Patrolmen's Association. And, Steve, that is a labor union representing police officers, right? Yeah, that's correct. I represent the um, patrolmen, uh, detectives, uh, dispatchers, and bailiffs here in the city of Cleveland. So the dispatchers, too? Yeah, yeah, the dispatchers. We have about 90 dispatchers. We need about 20 more. Well, that's actually, that's actually unusual, man, and it's, it's a good thing. And I think that's a model that we need to, uh, we probably need to replicate more out here because we, we don't have uh, any unions out here, as far as I know, right. that yeah, have dispatchers know. in for representation because that, that actually yeah. is a, a good well, idea. I've never, I've never seen great, that. It's a huge asset to us because the, the dispatchers, you know, they know real time what's going on. 
And I get calls very, very quickly if there's a police officer involved in an accident or going to the hospital or, you know, um, something like that where, you know, I'm on the group one page for the city and it takes sometimes 20 or 30 minutes. For, uh, for that mass notification, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was on that as a department. I, I find out things way before that, that went out. <laughs> now, now, Steve, so, um, again, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of shows ago, we talked about the Tamir Rice shooting. Yes, and, um, and, and in that, there were questions comments we made regarding the officer's tactics um, regarding some of the uh, based on that Justice Department uh, report that you mentioned earlier that spoke about the training and the equipment and that sort of thing and things that we felt uh, precipitated that shooting at least that's the conclusion we arrived at based on what we were able to find out what can you tell us about that 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 most people probably don't know about that situation yeah the the um, first of all the Cadell Rec Center is, is a haven for uh, a street gang called the, the Heartless Felons. Um, it, it's their hangout. There's multiple, multiple arrests. We've had, prior to Tamir Rice incident, um, we had 42 calls for service for gun and gang violence in there. We've had shootings up there. Um, I, uh, I've had two police officers killed in the line of duty within, uh, one of them within 100 yards of that rec center and the other one within a half a block of the rec center wow. um, within a 15 per, uh, year period of time so um, so there's a history of, of violence and, and, and gun and gang violence so going right, going in we have to take these gun calls very very seriously um, in this particular case there was a very good description of Tamir um, the, the both officers keyed on a camouflage hat a skull cap that he was wearing. Um, they came in um, through the back of the rec center. Um, they saw uh, Tamir Rice sitting on the on the desk on the table. Um, and and when he when Tamir saw them, he stood up and he they watched him put a gun in his waistband. So this is the guy, you know. This is the guy that the African American gentleman was calling about. He's pointing a gun at people walking through the park. He's pointing a gun at people driving by in their cars. Um, it, you know, that was the original call. In fact, the, um, the gentleman uh, later gave the sheriffs a statement out here saying that he, he waited till Tamir Rice had turned his back to him before he got on his cell phone because he, he did not want to get shot, giving the appearance that he was calling the police on the young man. Now, Steve, you know, so, uh, Steve, so uh, just that's the right setup for for the for the call. Um, it's a gun run um, in a known gun and gang violent area. So they came in, they see Tamir Rice, um, they approached him through the park, which was a tactical decision that they made because we have an open rec center, fellas. We have an open rec center with kids playing ping pong in this place, and the last thing that we want is a guy that we know has a gun running into that rec center. Then we got a whole bunch of really bad problems, right? That's what's going through the officer's mind. Um, as they approached, what police officers know is that guys with guns usually run from us, right? They usually run from 99% of the time. Typically, They yes. run from us. Um, Tamir didn't run from us. Now all of a sudden we have a, 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 a physical problem with the car because we're expecting to be chasing this kid through a field that's what we want we want him running away if he's going to run we want him running away from that rec center that was the mindset now he's not running at all so officer garnbeck was standing on the brake of that police car and that car skidded in the in the snow and the, the the grass 17 feet eight inches now see steve that, that's an important new point. charger with the analog brakes chugging away you know that that boom, 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 boom. That, that's an important point because one of the criticisms that we leveled was the uh, lack of use of cover. Was that how come the officer didn't stop farther back to engage that suspect? But based on what you're saying, he did try to stop farther back. He, oh, he tried, yeah, that car skidded for 17 feet, 8 inches um, in, in the grass um, because Tamir Rice didn't run. And in fact, he stood up and he started walking towards the police officers. And, and um, now, now, and, 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 not, not, and this is not victimizing, uh, not demonizing the victim at all. No. Because he knows he doesn't have a real gun, and so yeah. he's not thinking that he needs to run or anything like that. And it's, but it's, the officers and, don't know and, any of this. And I'll tell you, before I've talked to anybody, 
about this, I, and I apologize for not doing it. I, I, I cannot tell you what an absolute tragedy this is. You know, there's not a policeman out there that wants to hurt anybody, let alone a, a 12-year-old kid. You know, and, and our hearts go out to the family. I've reached out to the family. You know, I can't imagine. I have four kids and two grandkids, and I can't imagine losing any one of them. They're in my entire life. So this is absolutely a tragedy, you know. And that's how we've handled it from, from day one. And it's a tragedy for the police officers involved and their families right. um, because you know they're going through some stuff up here. Definitely. So Tamir takes a couple steps towards the police officers, towards the marked police car that's coming directly at him, essentially, you know, directly at that pavilion, and and he pulled that gun. And we all have seen the video, and the enhanced version is, is even more apparent. He pulled that gun from his waistband. Now, I'm not saying for one second that Tamir Rice was trying to get into a gunfight with the Cleveland Police Department. He was a 12-year-old kid. He was probably either trying to throw the thing in the snowbank or say, hey, fellas, it's a, it's a toy gun, it's a right. baby gun, you know? But those officers don't have the luxury of finding out if they're going to get a, a BB shot at them or a bullet shot at them. You know, they have a, a, a five foot, five foot seven, 191 pound person, instead of running, pulling a gun out of his waistband on a gun run mm -hmm. in a, a known drug and gang violent uh, location. You know, so the totality of the circumstances and the totality of the information that they had at the time, um, all kinds of red flags. The hair on the back of their neck was, was standing up. Oh, my God, he's pulling that gun out, you know. And, and Officer Lohman um, did what he was trained to do in that. And if you watch that video afterwards, Officer Lohman, what did he do? He bailed out of that car and went around to the back to take cover because he didn't know if he was still going to be involved in a gunfight or not. Um, officer Garnbeck immediately got on the radio and called for EMS. I, we have a Wait, which officer was, was the shooter and which was the driver? Um, Garnbeck was the driver. Okay. He was the FTO, and Tim Lohman um, was the rookie on probation. Um, when we say Tim probation for everybody, probation means you're a new police officer. You're on probation at your job. It's not like for a six months, criminal yes, court-ordered probation thing. It's just an employment probationary period. Yes, sir. It's, well, I... Yeah, it, we have to explain that because you know, most people watching our show are not don't have a law enforcement background, so we do try to make sure they understand that when we use these terms. Yeah, I, I apologize. Well, now but, let me um, ask you this. Okay, so then another of the criticisms uh, um, that's been leveled and one that we echoed here on the show was that after Tamir Rice had been shot, there was no attempt made to render first aid or trauma care or anything like that uh, yeah. to him. Um, that's completely false. Uh, in a three and a half minute period of time, um, Frank Garbeck and Tim Lohman called for EMS um, five times, and then finally on the sixth time, Frank Garbeck called and said, radio, we're looking at a fire department. In Cleveland, all our firemen are EMT or paramedic trained medical people as well. We're looking at the fire department. There's a fire department right across from that rec center. Send us a fireman over here. Um, Tamir Rice, they, they were talking to him. They were trying to calm him. You know, that's, that, that's not something that's going to be on the video. You know, there's human beings. The, the, the kid is hurting down there. And his injuries weren't um, something that, and I should, I should tell you this, we have zero medical training in the city of Cleveland Police Department. None. I can't put a Band-Aid on a paper cut. Um, See, and that, no was, that was part of, uh, that was one of the things that we were wondering is if why those officers didn't take uh, their trauma kits out right. to, you, treat, guys, to treat him. Do your officers carry those, Steve, a uh, blowout kit or IFAC? The, carry what? A blowout kit or an IFAC? An individual first aid kit. No, uh, no, no. Wow. We, it, if the guys have them, it's a lot of our military guys carry go bags and right. they put their own stuff in it. Right. But there's nothing from... Um, the city of Cleveland. Now, that's not untypical. Just, just now, and because of this, um, they've equipped the cars. You know, the safety director. Um, I, I was complaining to the media. You know, hey, you're you're blaming us for not doing medical care for three and a half minutes because that's all it was. And until the FBI field medic showed up, who was working with one of our detectives, and then he started um, doing some medical care. But 
but Tamir Rice was not bleeding outwardly. You know, there wasn't even anything that, it, that any human being instinctually would have saw. If you saw somebody bleeding, you'd put some pressure on it. Well, he wasn't, he, there was nothing outwardly. And they were fearful that whatever they did, if they put pressure on something, that, that it could possibly make things worse. You know, so they called and called. They called six times in a three-and-a-half-minute period of time for EMS. Finally, a field medic from the uh, FBI came, and he started doing his thing, and he instructed our officers in what to do, and they did it. So um, there was no lack know, of duty or care or anything like that. I mean, that's what we had been led to believe based on everything that was available to us in the media yeah. and based on the video and just based on what we saw uh, was that there was no attempt to do anything like that. But again, there was a, that, I'm sure that would be a very long video to watch all of that unfold. And there are certain things that, as you said, wouldn't have been available to us uh, to know on the video. We wouldn't know if they were speaking to him, and we wouldn't know that there were several attempts made to, to uh, call for EMS. Six. In three and a half minutes, um, six, six attempts to call EMS, um, they arrived um, very quickly. There was, a, you know, a four-minute... I could, I'm could. i sitting in my office right now. I could have a heart attack. You guys could call 911 in Cleveland for me. And I promise you I'm not going to see a, a paramedic here for 10 minutes. Right. You Incredible. Know, so a four-minute response time for medical treatment, any medical treatment, is, is outstanding. You know, but it doesn't meet the narrative that the ambulance chasers need to show that we're uncaring or that we're unsympathetic or that we, you know, want this kid to... to to die in front of us you know that's just nothing could be further from the truth and and that again is part of the false narrative that you know adds to this national discussion you know these these types and i really appreciate the opportunity to be able to to you know speak to you guys on this well i, I thank you for, for enlightening us on this because this is something that again we didn't know i'm sure most of our our viewers our listeners didn't know and to and be able to get this from someone who's state. there working that agency, uh, yeah. you know, this is actually a, a great opportunity for people to get more more information than yeah. has been made and available it's, to it's, us. It's, it's all supported by statement and, and you know, um, in fact. And the, the um, sheriff's department released, you know, their investigation, or the, well, actually the county prosecutor released it, uh, the sheriff's investigation. So this is all stuff that's verifiable. This isn't just Loomis telling you guys a story these are facts that were uncovered in the sheriff's investigation for this all right well yeah, hey so, steve um, i really appreciate you calling in okay. um thank you for your time this has uh, been been very illuminating for me personally at least to uh to hear some of this information that we haven't we haven't heard before and to yeah, get a perspective hope, uh, that we haven't seen before I, I really appreciate the opportunity and i hope um i don't know who who it was but my uh my vice president was listening to your radio show while I was at the meeting. Comes in and says that one of you guys was saying that these guys should be fired. You know that the F, the, the FTO should be fired. Steve, I wasn't it. here when that conversation happened, so it wasn't me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where he got it from, but but it's one of know, these two. Um, it it was one of us. I won't I won't say who it was. Okay. But he's probably <laughs> sitting right in the middle of, of no, us, but no, Gil and I right no, now. No, I won't say who it was. But Kent wasn't there that day, and it wasn't me. So, <laughs> oh, well, okay. I, I appreciate that, and I hope I was able to, to to turn your opinion a little bit on that. You know, these guys do a great job out here in Cleveland. And police officers in general, and you guys know, you know, we're not doing this job because it's we want to get rich. It just doesn't happen. You right. know, it's a, it's a way for us to give back to the community instead of sitting around and complaining about the way things are. You know, we go out there and we do the job, and we make it a better place for our, our families, our neighbors to live and and that's why we do it it's it sounds corny but it's a calling and and every police officer out there knows that most of them are doing it for the right reason some maybe not but most of them are and you know the um the vast majority of great works that these officers are doing here in cleveland go unnoticed by the media because it doesn't sell airtime it doesn't sell commercial. right it's not sexy it you know it's, you it's know, not it something that it's not sensational with the, with the collective um it doesn't resonate with the collective, you know, what I call false narrative that's that's out there. And it, police officers do not deserve that, and they are absolutely in self-preservation mode, you know. And there, there's no way to get around that until the pendulum starts swinging. you got to make up our minds for us. Do you want us to be police officers and actually go out and proactively police and make the neighborhoods as safe as possible? 
or do you want us to appear to be police officers? You can't have it both ways. Well, well you know, I said that society gets the police that they deserve. That's, yeah, that's what's exactly. been said over and over again. And, and that, that, that's where we're headed is uh, we, we, want, we, want, uh, uh, we want the appearance of police officers, but we don't really want them doing police work anymore. Well, one of the suggestions that we made to the um, Department of Justice, by the way, I, I, made, I gave them a 10-page letter with suggestions that, from our perspective of what we should do. Um, we, we need to get back into a community policing model. Where every police officer in Cleveland believes in that. And we, the mini stations are very, very expensive for the city. We understand that. I understand that. So how but, do you But so are that? lawsuits, and, and so is all the negative publicity. Absolutely. They're going to spend well, the money. The city gets sued by everybody. You know, we're, the, 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 the folks that are involved in this, you know, sue the city, and they'll, they'll write a $3 million check um, just because. But then the police officers, we have, uh, um, we have another um, high-profile case and uh, 10 of the 13 police officers that were involved in that are suing the city. You know, so the city's Well, that's, that's another sides. thing, and actually that's a topic we need to cover, too, is in internal lawsuits in police departments and how, how that's a big deal. So, Steve, uh, again, yes, man, sir. thank you for calling in. Really appreciate it. I'm sure we'll be reaching out to you in the future. You've been a great guest. Um, we're going to have to start wrapping our show uh, yes, at this point, and, and I really do appreciate you calling in, man. And spread the word about the show to your membership. Yeah, I absolutely will. I'm going to put it on the website right now. Appreciate <laughs> it, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Steve. Steve. Folks. Thank All right. Okay, folks. So um, we're going to start uh, wrapping up our show here. Uh, again, you can find us on Facebook. Like us on Facebook. Uh, we're on Instagram at Ride Along Radio Show. Uh, we're on Twitter, Ride Along Radio. And you can even send us an email, Ride Along Radio Show at gmail.com. And that's especially useful if you want to suggest future show topics. One of the things we've been kicking around is the legalization of drugs and some other things. Um, that's a pretty meaty topic, but I think we can compress it and uh, get into some real conversation about that in, in, in an hour's time. And um, keep the number handy on your phone for speed dial next time at 323-293-3375. I want to thank my co-hosts, Gil and Kent. I want to thank our executive producer, The Poetess, for making everything run so smoothly. And thanks to intern Darren for uh, monitoring our social media and uh, making sure everything else around here uh, gets done that we need to have done. And uh, we will see you all next Thursday uh, on the Ride Long Radio Show. You got off light today, didn't you? Yeah, he did. Yeah. <laughs>